Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Hello, I'm Gary Miller, Provost of Wichita State University. Welcome to Wichita State and the World. Through this series, you'll meet researchers, top thinkers, and leaders whose innovative work is reshaping our community, the state of Kansas, the nation, and the world. We're fortunate at Wichita State to have one of the country's best outdoor sculpture collections. Public Art Review has ranked the Martin Bush Collection in the top 10 among campuses nationwide. It includes more than 70 pieces spread across our 330-acre campus by some of the world's most notable artists. The latest edition is by Wichita native Tom Otterness. This hour will take you to Otterness's studio in New York City and to the Wichita State University campus where his 24-foot bronze millipede was recently installed in front of Wichita State's Ulrich Museum of Contemporary Art. style is quirky and engaging and that's part of what makes him such a great public sculptor. He goes after core issues in our culture, um, struggles um, between doing the right thing and the wrong thing, um, ha the haves and the have-nots, but He's very, he thinks very carefully about the ways to really reach out and engage a general public as a, a public artist as well. So he uses cartoon figures um, and they're Tom's own little characters, men and women, but animals in there as well. And they have both uh, a cartoonish quality, but a mythic character at the same time. So it's easy to see a work and know that it's by Tom. I think there are ways that Tom's upbringing in Wichita have influenced him and have made an impact in his art. Midwesterners, in general, are a people that are very straightforward. What you see is what you get. Hi, everybody. I, I'm amazed how many people show up. I've got, you know, I've got high school friends. I've got sisters here. I've got uh, junior high friends, grade school friends, um, and even my first school. Really, the uh, I've got a couple people here that knew me when I hunted in the creek behind our house. You know, that was my first school. Really, he cares so very much about connecting not only with the art world, of course he cares about that, but he cares about connecting to when his work is placed in a, a, a park or in front of a courthouse or a federal building or at the harbor. He, he wants a response and interaction from people and he thinks very consciously about the ways that he can work his art making to elicit and, and engage people. And I think in part that may come from growing up in the Midwest where um, there's, there's a, a simplicity, a, a lack of uh, complexity. Tom Otterness, uh, sculptor. Hey, what's up with that? Oh, well, we're putting in the millipede. gathered here today um, welcoming Millie the Millipede by Tom Otterness to Wichita State University campus. She came in on a flatbed truck from Beacon, New York, that's a little north of Manhattan, and was driven on the truck all the way across the country. Uh, got here late last night and 
we there's a company from Chicago methods and materials who specialize in art moving and so their crew is here today and we see them behind me um, they were the people responsible for craning this sculpture that's nearly four tons of bronze off the flatbed and into position here in front of the Ulrich Museum of Art. For Tom, he liked that there are individual segments to the, the creature itself and for him that symbolizes the different divisions, the different departments in a university that nonetheless are all coordinated and marching together toward a, a, a common goal. Idea of a kind of a mass of of individuals working together, you know. I I, I thought, I mean, it's kind, you know, we know how seldom that happens at a university where you actually go in the same direction. So I thought that wouldn't be bad here, you know. It was only last week that I discovered the artist had added on a little touch. Uh, really, very late for a sculpture project, it occurred to me. I was at the foundry and we had all the feet cut off, you know, you weld them together and have them all on a level plate. And, uh, and I thought, oh, a little action here. So I kicked up the back heel and uh, back in the backside. And, um, and then I thought, oh, I need something more. And, and uh, I went to get a little tiny figure. She is roughly three inches tall, although the millipede itself is 24 feet long by five foot wide by four foot tall. We found her as a kind of prototype and, you know, kind of cut and bent and welded and, and made her fit in there. So that was really the last minute to get her kind of setting Millie in motion. Is that little figure pulling off the last shoe? <laughs> Is, is it helping the insect slip into the shoe? Is she pushing it forward? It, it, it's not exactly clear, and, and that's part of what uh, makes that character so endearing. We had, this is a, was the location here on the island where, where people always plant tulips and stuff, and I thought, oh, this makes sense. Have the millipede out here eating tulips. I thought it also relates to the Miro mural up there, kind of wacky birds and... Uh, who knows what's really up there. Here we are at the Ulrich Museum of Art and we have the wonderful, really masterpiece of Jean Moreau, a Spanish surrealist um, a mosaic mural that actually we're celebrating its 30th anniversary this fall. And that is a piece of, I've come to call it magical realism. There are bird people, creatures who are part of that. And so we have this millipede that is 24 foot long by four foot wide by five foot tall, a kind of Gulliver's Travel millipede, if you will. And, and so again, a little bit of magical realism. So this work has a relationship, a kind of conversation, if you will, with the Jean Miro mural. If it means a lot to the university, it means even more to me to be here and, and be offered this place and, this, and really kind of the heart of the university, especially the old university, was really here. And um, this premier place in front of the Miro, which I love dearly, um, and, um, and in, the middle of, in the middle of my hometown. So it, it really means everything to me. Tom has two prominent works in the city of Wichita, one in front of the Wichita Art Museum and now one on Wichita State University campus. The work at the Wichita Art Museum is from, it's, a, it's an extract, if you will, from the major commission that he did for the Museum of Modern Art in New York in the late 80s. That show then toured internationally and actually also came to Wichita. It's uh, Tom at an earlier point in his career where he, he still grapples with um, sometimes tough questions in life. In that earlier moment, he was doing so a bit more metaphorically, a bit more allegorically. And, and so that's an earlier and different kind of Tom, different kind of moment.
the Martin H. Bush Sculpture Collection at Wichita State University is really something extraordinary. It's a national gem. As a matter of fact, um, in 2006, Public Art Review, which really is the journal, the magazine for the public art community, uh, did an article and named Wichita State University collection, our, our campus art collection, is one of the top 10 in the country. We now have 76 works that are part of that co collection that are strewn across a 330-acre campus. Nationally and internationally renowned names are part of it. So Henry Moore and Luis Jimenez, Klaus Oldenburg, uh, now Tom Modernist. Traditionally, art museums uh, don't like it when people touch works of art. Tom Otternus, the artist, feels a little bit differently. Well, I always like my sculpture to be climbed on. That's, uh, you know, they have, uh, it causes some problems sometimes, the university, because they'll, they'll, they'll want every other sculpture not to be climbed on, but you can climb on this one. So, um, I like how the bronze gets polished up. Uh, I like that people hang out on it. It might want to get a little warmer than this before people start uh, sitting on it and, and uh, lay it lay it sunbathing. It isn't time for sunbathing yet, but. So he absolutely imagines people sitting on top of and riding that lovable bug. He wants to come and see places on the sculpture where it's more worn and shiny because people have been petting a, a certain spot. He likes to see that with his works of art. As the art museum director, do I want to tell a public audience that, yes, come and jump up and down on it? Probably not. Do I understand Tom's impulses as the artist? Oh, I absolutely do. And I know because we've put it into the public realm, people will ride that insect. Tom, Tom Otternus is a major sculptor. He has an incredible studio. It's, it's quite a factory, it's quite a complex. He employs many, many people there. It's in Brooklyn. It's in basically a factory neighborhood or a warehouse neighborhood. It's quite large. Um, they, there's a many part process to creating bronze sculpture, large uh, scale bronze sculpture. And uh, he has many people who do computer animations of what a work as he's conceiving it will look like in the particular outdoor environment where it ultimately will uh, rest. And, and so that's part of the studio, but uh, a more fun part of the studio for the general public, I would think, are the areas where there, there are mold makers. Uh, and Tom himself uh, you know, gets in there and um, works to create forms or figures or some of his wonderful characters. Many of his works are also multiple parts, multiple characters. So there are many uh, figures that are part of a, a particular single work and each of those need to uh, be made and they make them in different kind of materials along the way. Um, ultimately, the bronze sculptures go to a foundry to be created in, in the bronze. That's not something that Tom does himself at his studio in Brooklyn. And he doesn't actually work exclusively with one foundry. He's such a significant artist with different kind of projects that are going on at, 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 at different levels um, and at different stages all the time. It's kind of a madhouse <laughs> scene to go there because it's such a beehive of activity. There's a lot of humor and whimsy and, and just fun <laughs> in his work as well. He's one of our country's leading sculptors and a very, very public artist. His work appears in art museums uh, around um, around the country, around the world. He's had exhibitions in most of the premier art museums in our country, including, just as examples, the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City. Yet the places where the majority of people encounter Tom's work 
are not in galleries. They're in public parks, libraries, federal buildings, courthouses. He's even got a commission of many of Tom's wonderful people that is down in the subway in New York City. Heck, uh, Tom was the first artist who had a balloon in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. In 2005, Tom's upside-down mammoth Humpty Dumpty, you know, floated down uh, Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. So, to give you the quickest glimpse of his career, as I said before, Tom was born and raised in Wichita. He left for New York and he attended the Art Students League there in the early 70s. He also took part in the independent study program of the Whitney Museum of American Art. He's the co-founder of an artist collaborative in the 70s that was called Collaborative Projects, although it's really best known by its abbreviation, which is CoLab. In 1987, Tom had achieved such recognition that the Museum of Modern Art commissioned him to create a work for their courtyard garden. And Tom created a work that he titled The Tables. It traveled internationally, and it traveled some around the country. And um, some of you who are uh, long-term and native Wichitans may remember it because it also came here and was presented at the Wichita Art Museum. Tom's Dreamers Awake, which is that magnificent sculpture in front of the Wichita Art Museum um, that's been there since 1995, is an aspect of that much larger uh, project called The Tables. And, and I could go on, but I'm going to stop right here because I know Tom is going to cover some of this ground. Tom, we're handing this over to you. Please come, um, you know, let this hometown welcome you again. That's so sweet. Thanks. Um, oh, I, I, I tried to, um, I put together a slideshow that's trying, uh, I thought, oh, this is hometown. So I went through my mom's uh, house and had works, early works photographed. And I, like I said before, I've got high school art teachers and junior high school teachers here and, and uh, a lot of friends from those early days. Um, uh, in fact, that, that um, one of the friends from the creek is here, uh, Greg Phelps, and um, um, I remember it's sort of a, I ran into Danny, uh, Danny Stuber, and Danny, uh, after, I hadn't seen him for a long time, you know, <laughs> since we were 10 or something, and uh, he told me this story. He said, Tom, you remember that day, uh, uh, me and Greg and you were together, and we were, you know, we were always cowboys, right? White hats, black hats, whatever. And we'd say, okay, let's, let's, let's go home and, and let's have a fast draw contest. And, and they all ran, everybody ran home, and, and they came back with their guns and holsters, and I came back with a, pen, with a pencil and paper. You know? <laughs> and I thought, oh, that, that, that said something about my future here, you know? Uh, God, and I spent so much time, of course, my mom is, I'm gonna show some stuff I did. My mom, I was hoping um, she would be here for this, for her 89th birthday was last, would have been last week, and she, she died in the summer. And uh, I designed a headstone, I'm gonna show you that. And uh, she's my biggest supporter, and, and uh, since this is hometown, you guys will understand. Uh, yeah, Garnett, she's the babe. Um, oh, and I spent a lot of time, you know, all the way up, I knew I'd be an artist. I'd, I met my, one of my English teachers came here from high school, and I, I remember I didn't, uh, I refused to learn how to spell. I said, oh, I, I, I'm going to be an artist. I don't need to spell, you know. <laughs> uh, so I kind of struggled my way through, through school here. I had to, I, I got a scholarship to the Art Students League in New York at 18, um, but it's not a college, it's just an art, it's an art school. But the only requirement for the scholarship was by, that I'd be in the upper half of my class, and I, I wasn't. So I had to go around, like Mel Schrader I think is here, I, I had to get letters from all my teachers to say I wasn't 
quite as, you know, I, that I was better, I was more intelligent than my grades might show, you know? So, um, and I, I spent a lot of time, I'll show the slides from work that I did in, in both, in all these different places, but uh, I spent a lot of time at the, uh, with David Sally at the uh, Wichita Art Association and with Bill and Betty Dickerson, and it's such a fabulous place. It was such a precious moment. And we started, God, I think David was 11, and I was maybe 12 or 13. I was too embarrassed when I first went in. My mom took me maybe at eight, and they had sort of semi-naked models there, and I, I, I went, oh, no, I can't do this yet. <laughs> and then I went back at 13, and I said, okay. <laughs> I can do this. Um, so we spent a lot of time there, and you get a really, we got a college education, and we had studios together downtown, and David's father would find places where my mom would, um, that we could use uh, the old downtown, we'd have studios and in high school. Um, and Mr. Weddle would, I remember in high school, he would let me uh, smoke in the lock, in the storage room, you know? Now that we're both out of there, we can confess, you know. <laughs> what I'm going to show first is, is, is a picture of my mom. It's the one she would have liked, I know. You know, we have more recent ones. But this is, if Ma was here, she would be saying, now, you know, show that pretty one, you know. <laughs> this may be a new line of work for me. I've, I've, I've designed her headstone, so I thought I'd show you guys since I don't know who else is going to ever see it. We... She came from a farm family in South Dakota, 13 kids, and we went back up with her there and uh, uh, so she could be with her family up, up there, mom and brothers and sisters. Um, so this is, this is her headstone. This is a, uh, the draft for the uh, design of it. And then that's at, at, the, at the place. Um, and it's, um, this actually is a computer program, if you can believe it. The stone hasn't been cut yet, so all this is just a computer rendering. Um, and then I put, uh, I put one of the little bears in back to kind of look, look down, so that's that. You'll forgive me for doing this, right? This is sort of like the, the, the family slideshow that you have to sit through, but... Uh, so this is early work. This, this one I did at 14. It was one of my, you can't make sculpture really at, uh, you know, it's very expensive to do it. This was made in, in, uh, originally in clay, fired clay at Mr. Kinney's class in, um, in Coleman. And I got going on it and in the middle of the day and just kind of kept going. And Mr. Kinney managed to get to the principal and the, and the super or whoever was taking care of it and kept the building open for me, and I just worked straight through, uh, oh, I think 9 or 10 o'clock at night or something at the school, and, and finished it up. So it's, it, otherwise, I painted until I was about 30, so I didn't do another sculpture again, really, in, in, until my late 20s. Um, this is the stuff I did in, in Mr. Weddle's class. Um, part of what got me the scholarship to the Art Students League And in a funny way, I think these relate most to my, my uh, later work and just kind of the simplicity of it and stuff. And a Kansas landscape. And that's a self-portrait, you know, uh, from those, from those uh, hippie days back then. <laughs> Hasn't changed much for me, yeah. Um, <laughs> and these are, these are studies from um, uh, uh, Betty Dickerson's class, so we all painted a certain style, a kind of um, Richard Diebenkorn style, so and I did paintings then. And this is my grandfather, I think. Oh. And these are early studies. These are all things that were in my mom's house. It's sort of like a little Tom museum there. So, uh, you know, and it's always, I come back and the place is 
stuffed with my, my things, you know. Um, this was one, now nobody else has seen this. is I, my first job in New York. I was a night watchman at the Museum of Natural History. <laughs> and I took this camera on a tripod and set this up. You know, I like set the camera up and then pushed it and jumped in and stood there, you know. So you're the only ones that have seen this, you know. <laughs> I don't know what it means exactly to be behind these two elephants, but. <laughs> And these were studies. This was a study I did later in then, you know, was, I was 20 or something uh, from a statue at Museum of Natural History. I love that place. I used to draw there day and night and I finally just kept applying for jobs and ended up uh, getting to be a night watchman for about four years. And then, and then I went to anthropology. Oh. And these are really the first sculptures that I did. They, um, they're, uh, you know, about six inches high. Uh, I sold them for $4.99 on the sidewalks in New York and, and different shops that we had. Um, I was part of a collective of really now well-known artists, but none of us uh, had a thing at the time. There were about 50 artists, uh, Kiki Smith and Jenny Holzer and a bunch of other people that, um, uh, good artists, and we would do shows and, and try to get out in public, and that was the, the start of, of my thinking about the public. I had been a very hermetic kind of painter, um, and bit by bit, you, um, I, I, I learned to do things like this, you know, <laughs> talk in public, and, um, and so these, these, those little sculptures, eventually every time I'd make a buck, they'd get a little bigger, you know, and, and, uh, this is um, free money uh, is the dancing, dancing on the money bag and then the last penny. That was from later. Um, and then this is the clay. I'm standing next to the original clay. And these, again, this is the 499 one on the left. On the right is the basic way I work. I have a drawers full of different wax figures and I cast them in molds. And they're like toys, and they have, you know, my characters, really, basic characters are uh, white-collar workers, blue-collar workers, uh, all male and female, um, radicals who have no clothes, little pointed hats, uh, uh, cops, uh, and rich people, my favorite, you know? So I pull these out, and, and I, you warm up the wax in warm water, and then twist them into positions. Um, and that's what makes these small sculptures and allows me to sort of animate them. It really comes, a lot of the work comes out of animation, out of, um, oh, watching, you know, uh, 20 cartoons from the 20s and 30s on TV when I was growing up. That's that style, tubular arms, and, and it's a sort of system of animating that I brought into sculpture. And this on the left is, is Humpty Dumpty fiddling. This is. Uh, I call it the real world, but the kids call it the Penny Park in New York. Um, uh, he's, also, he's on top of, the, of this building of rich people, and he's also fallen down and broken open. And that gives some idea of how I work the waxes. So you can bend these, bend these figures in different positions. And this is the first project. This is that one, the Penny Park. Um, I keep waiting for these kids to grow up and start making money and buying sculpture, you know? It's like, <laughs> it's like a crop. You plant them early and then they get to be, I think by about now they've, you know, there's, you know, that kid might be 22, so maybe he's starting to earn something, but. Um, the dog is, is chained to the water fountain and then it's going up to try to get a cat. The cat's trying to get a bird. The bird's trying to eat a worm. And uh, the worm is sticking its tongue out. So it's a sort of food chain. There. <laughs> it's such a great shot. This, <laughs> I got this sent to me, but there's a professional photographer walking his dog and he, he said his dog went straight up to it and did this, right? And, um, but he missed the shot. So 
he had to get down on the ground with the bronze bulldog and pet it and talk to it, and his dog came back and said, well, I must have made a mistake, and went, checked it out, and then he got the shot. <laughs> I've got to make a postcard out of this thing, I think. This is, uh, there was that subway project that I did in New York, this, and, and it took a 10-year period to do this. Um, mostly because I was done in about five years and the subway took, you know, forever. Um, and so I had the works done and I did some temporary shows. This is in, in, uh, at the bottom of Central Park. And these guys would come and perform around the work. My work is on the I-beams and these little bronzes on the I-beams, but they would perform around it and make money on Sundays and stuff. This is a New York scene. Um, and then I would get these kind of collaborations. I, I look for that in the work. I, I think, you know, standing on it is pretty typical, but I thought the, the speakers and stuff made a nice sculpture by themselves. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, I try to find a way to have people engage, like, like the millipede here. I'm, I can't wait for it to really get summer and, and you know, get climbed on and, and uh, polished up and all that. This again is a subway project. That's my daughter Kelly. Um, to give you an idea, she's now 16, so this is a going back a ways. But um, this is the uh, uh, classic alligator coming out of the sewer in New York. Uh, he's eat you can't quite see it, but he's eating a guy with a money bag head. You know, um, for that project, I had gone. I had gone to. Uh, Thomas Nast. Uh, I, I try to do research on these projects uh, as I get them and try to make them subject specific. Like the, the first one you looked at was, was close to Wall Street and World Financial Center, so money was the center of everything. Um, as it is everywhere, I guess. But um, uh, in this one I went to the history of the subways and, and they were built in the 1880s and I went to Thomas Nast and it was, his work is all about uh, political corruption in New York City, Tammany Hall, and, and, uh, um, and nothing seemed to have changed all that much. So I, I just pretty much adopted it and, and, and put it down on the subway. Yeah, this is the same stuff. I love the photographs, yeah. And then I've got, at one point, I've, I like giving this kind of heroic strength to these bronzes. It's what, this same idea is what uh, the little gal pushing the millipede is. You can just give, it's like Mighty Mouse. It's another animation, uh, you know, advantage that you can, they can have any amount of strength. And then the guys on the right are uh, fair beaters crawling under the subway fence. So, and then the cop is waiting there to catch them, you know. And this is, this is the work finally installed in the subway. Um, I think they get something like 30,000 people an hour during rush hour, so it's this amazing place. I ended up putting in, um, oh, probably five times what they paid me, you know, as far as the amount of bronze and what I was commissioned for, uh, just because I got more and more excited. It, it, it took a long time to install, so I would put two or three pieces out, and then I'd watch, and I'd go down and see where people gathered and how they treated it, and, and then I would put out a few more. And so the installation went over a period of two years. Um, here are the fair beaters on the right in place. Um, and this one on the left is educating the rich. So she's, she's sitting on top of the guy, giving him a, a lesson of sorts. <laughs> um, and this is the covered wagon on the left, and uh, the the drawing on the right is is actually an yeah. You know, when I did the tables, and I was I was actually working on a picnic table out in Wisconsin. I had a summer studio out there, and um, I was really outdoors, and I was doing these drawings, thinking about kind of a midwestern. Uh, communist sculpture that was either being built or fallen apart. I wasn't sure which. Uh, but this has some relationship to what then became the small dreamers awake on the tables. This was one of the early studies for it. Um, and then the covered wagon on the left is, is uh, oh, it's, 
it's sort of the classic family vacation, you know, where you've got mom, mom driving the car and uh, dad's the bull pulling. And, and if you look closely, the kids are out in the back, you know, strangling each other. So. <laughs> so it goes from these drawings. I always start with drawings. Uh, and from the drawings, I go to clay. And this, this model is about five feet. Um, so it's all water-based clay. Um, and this is really the fun part. This is the, the part that um, I work all night on, or this is what really gets me exciting. Um, so from that small scale model, then go up to the big scale, up to um, uh, this one's eight feet high and about 15 feet long. Um, and it's in Walla Walla, Washington, um, in Pioneer Park out there. This guy, this guy happened, I had a sculpture, it was really by chance, I had a sculpture with the guy up against the wall and I, I had to fit him behind some glass so I cut the back off and um, it was laying down on the foundry floor and I thought, oh, well, I can make use out of that sculpture too. So, um, you know, things happen in the process that give you ideas, uh, so I put that little figure next to it. And again, the, uh, this is the frog prince on the right, on the left, rather. Um, uh, the princess is sort of twiddling her thumbs, you know, kind of, is that it, you know? <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you laughing about? The girls usually laugh, you know, the guys. Uh, and then it's free money and bronze, and then my, my bear is in the background here. This was a show I had a, quite a while ago, five years ago or so at Marlboro. This was a, um, I really admire WPA art, and this was an artist that's in New Jersey, um, Mortolito, and I, this is a Mortolito Memorial. He did a murals there in New Jersey, and I did a version, a 3D version of his murals for uh, New Jersey Transit, and made a, a model of my idea of him painting the mural, so it was sort of a memorial to him. I ended up meeting his, his daughter and, and his family kind of through that internet connection and stuff. And this is sort of a nutty one. It was um, in uh, a federal courthouse in Minneapolis um, called The Rock Man. Um, I'd made these just, I don't know, I was in this strange mood and made this sculpture, small scale sculpture by just making blobs of clay and building a figure out of it. And then, uh, and then I got this commission and I put it forward and I, you know, all of a sudden the rock started sprouting arms and legs and um, this is the tourist rock on the left. Um, and this is in front of the courthouse and, and there's the jail across the way and uh, these are cops carrying off the bad rock over to jail, you know. <laughs> and this is, this is a project I did with uh, Maya Lin at the Cleveland Library, um, uh, these gates. So she, she did the, I had the gates and she did the center fountain. And then we, we collaborated on, on some of the ideas for the gates. Uh, so it's sort of a, uh, her brother Tan wrote the poetry and it's sort of like a, in the midst of making the sculpture. Sometimes I think of that about this as, as, as a good, mm, that public sculpture is in process, that it's uh, in the midst of making and that we're, we're all kind of making it as we go. Uh, and the bear. Um, this is kind of the, the bear on vacation, you know. Um, I love how these guys are kind of the same size as the bear, same shape. So this is something I look for, is see, see if I can get a setup where people come and take their family photos. I like to think I'm in more family albums than any other sculptor. And um, this is... Uh, the first sketch for the, uh, the park in Scheveningen, um, outside of The Hague. It's um, uh, probably my biggest commission. Um, 
It's a suburb of The Hague on the North Sea, and, uh, and this was the first proposal drawing for it. And these were other ideas. You see the frog prince and, and the lion, um, and, and these kind of, uh, what was I thinking of? And this was my version of, of uh, Hans Brinker. And the Dutch, yeah, you know, it's like the coming out of the ear. The, the Dutch, we understand dikes very differently. The Dutch thought it was, you know, I always thought, well, dikes, you know, the water's behind the wall, and then you got the wall, and then you stick the thumb in. Dikes don't work that way at all. And, uh, but the, the Dutch were amused by the American that comes over and thinks this is how dikes work, so they, <laughs> they let it go through. And this is, I go from the drawing to the small scale model. Um, like this is a one to 25 model. And then I'll, I'll uh, again, take those small wax figures and bend them for the large sculptures and kind of do the, um, the layout and work out all the details on that scale model. This is, my idea for this project was to take, it's on, a, it's on the North Sea and it's, there's sand dunes and uh, and there's a museum at the foot of that big figure. It's a herring eater. It's the way they eat herring in the Hague. So I drop it. And uh, um, on the site, I did the architecture for the site as well. And, and it's a kind of reduction of the larger landscape. So there's this idea of the North Sea and the sand dunes in the, in the sculpture. And there's a small model of the museum itself under the foot of that uh, big figure. So this, this is 45 feet high. Uh, I've got an engineer that promised me this would be okay. And I, I was really nervous about it, but in fact, it's been fine. They have these 100 mile an hour winds and it's survived everything. So um, there's a crying giant up in the front. Um, I don't know, there might be 40 or 50 sculptures. And then I, again, I add the small, the, there are, oh, a few dozen six inch figures. Um, scattered around. And this is the, the thumb in the dike. That's my daughter Kelly drinking from it. And the big Gulliver, um, 35 feet long. Uh, kids can crawl up and get inside the head and look out the eyes. This is a kind of Kafka-esque experience. You know, you look out of these eyes and see, oh, I've woken up with this 35-foot body, you know? And this is a clay model for the, um, for the uh, mouse and the lion. And then most of my, my works kind of fold over one into the other. So this mouse then got its own life and, and I've got a nine foot version of that now. So, you know, these ideas kind of uh, multiply. This is the work at night. And this was um, uh, the model for the crying giant on the left. You get an idea of the scale, about 12 feet high. And then there was a competition for the 9-11 memorial. And I, I, I've always wanted to do architecture. And I thought, well, clearly, I'm not going to get this um, proposal. But it's just paper. So you know, let's, I'd, I'd let myself go. And so this, this idea is that, it, that the um, this structure is like a 40-story tall building um, made out of glass and steel, and you could walk inside the figure. The arms and legs would be 40-foot diameter at this scale, so it's really enormous, and you could walk up inside the body in a spiral. Um, they didn't take it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, this is, these are drawings, first drawings for the um, a, a project I really loved. Uh, called What the Hay, and um, it's a sculpture. I've always liked outsider art and, and this sort of art on the fringe. Um, and this was, we have a place in Montana, my wife has family out there, and we heard about this, where farmers put uh, sculpture, they, they do hay sculpture every year. And so along this, this road, about a 20 mile strip of road, they every year after harvest, they make sculptures out of hay. And uh, I, 
I went and met the people and I made these sculptures and I got them in there within three weeks. It was really kind of an amazing thing the foundry did. Uh, and they're uh, faked hay bales. We actually, they look like solid hay bales, but they're not. And they're about 17 feet high. Um, this is Montana weather. Those two photos were taken within, you know, two days of each other. So, you know, the snow just blows in and blows out, you know. Um, so there are three of them. You can see the third way back in the back. And these are details. So mine's called Making Hay. But you get an idea of the scale from that. These are some of the other sculptures. Um, on the opening day, uh, you know, there was, it was a road that you could stand in for um, hours and not have to move. It was that quiet. On the opening day, there were 5,000 cars that came through. And it's a, kind of this word of mouth all up and down the grain belt up to Canada. And people vote. And um, as a New Yorker, and, you know, I, I recused myself from the competition. But they said I would have won, but very narrowly, you know. So... <laughs> Um, these are some of the other, other uh, uh, sculptures, Mickey Mouse and Buff Halo. Uh, you have to have hay in the name, SpongeBob, yeah, and the, the rabbit one, you know, so. And this is a show on Broadway. Um, I did a, a bunch of sculptures, maybe, mm, well, whatever's here. 25 sculptures or something like that, all the way up Broadway. Covered wagon again. Um, it was great. It went all the way up to 138th Street. Um, so it went through, New York has is, is got all these kind of social stratas, you know, as you go up. So it covered Upper West Side uh, all the way through uh, kind of uh, uh, Cuban ghettos up in up, up 138th Street. So it, a lot of different kinds of people saw the work. Gulliver again. This is Mad Mom, you know. I had guys, you see this stuff doing public art, I had a guy out there that was, you know, like really working out some stuff, a homeless guy that was really working out some stuff about his mom in front of that sculpture, you know. He's, he, was, he was having a conversation, you know. Uh, the Big Bear. And this was the block party. And this is really, this kind of stuff is, is what I look for, you know, kids crawling, crawling on it. And, um, and then we traveled to Indianapolis and it went around Beverly Hills and, and a few places around. This, this was sent to me on the internet. Somebody went around with his son and shot him at every, every place. I love, you come to the city, you know, it's so interesting to approach the city. Every city was a new city, so you'd, I'd think, try to think about the, where kind of a content relationship to the work, you know, how I could put the work. The Mad Mom on the right is in front of the Civil War Memorial that has the, the governor from the 1860s on top and then the two soldiers and then moms in front, you know. And this is on another war memorial. Indianapolis has got a lot of war memorials. Oh. And this, I think this is, you might get this in Kansas City. I don't know, think you get it in Wichita, but I thought, oh, I made the comics, you know. Um, zippy. Oh. And this is from the Humpty Dumpty. First drawings for it. Um, and this is for the small puppet that kind of goes under it, the cop that chased it around. So I did all, all these things on small scale models and then blow them up. Uh, they've got a fabulous place. It's really, uh, it's really great where they build the balloons. Yeah, and that's it flying. Um, I think it gets into 50 million homes. So for me it was, was uh, you know, the biggest public work that I've done. Um, 
and you know that's that's how I first knew New York really was growing up here and watching watching the uh, Macy's Day Parade and all that stuff. And this one's um, this one's a, a a playground that I built. It's the first piece I built in the computer, and um, I, I did a drawing first and then fed it in the computer. I've got a computer animator that works for me, and and. It's so convincing, that world is, is just amazing. Uh, I can't turn on my computers, but, but I can sit next to them and we can, you know, make this stuff. Um, and then that's the, the final product. Um, so it's 35 feet long and 17 feet high. Kids can get up inside the head and look out. It's like a fort inside the head. And then you slide down the slides and there's one swing. Um, I, I had done this for a public competition, but I lost the competition and I had the boards, the computer boards out in the studio. Uh, some collectors came by and his wife was pregnant and he looked at her and said, well, we've got to buy a swing set anyway, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just incredible. So you see, some, you see some amazing backyards in this business, I'll tell you, you know? Um, Yeah, and these are some of the details. Again, small figures on it crawling around, so they're these kind of detailed scenes. Um, and I, I like the way that sh shift in scale. I always think of it cinematically, the sculpture. So, you know, the big millipede makes you feel small, but you go to the little figure and you feel enormous, you know? So this this kind of shift in, in scale that I look for. Um, and this is, this is out, this is in Florida, um, and the collector put it there, um, uh, yeah, and so this is his idea, you know, to put it in the pool so that the kids can, can go off the slide into the pool. I thought, yeah, go ahead, okay. <laughs> And there's, this is the small millipede. And like I said, the, um, the projects usually fold one into another. Like, like um, from when Rodin would work, he did the Gates of Hell, you know, this enormous thing with 50 pieces in it. And then from that, he gets uh, the thinker was at the top, and, and that becomes a sculpture on its own. So it's just a natural way to be part of how sculpture develops, or at least this kind of figurative sculpture. Um, and so this was, this was part of a commission that I did, I don't know if I've got other slides from it, um, that I did for uh, Puerto Rico. I did a coqui frog, a big coqui, and then I did other insects that were in this cave, uh, in the Camoy Caves in Puerto Rico, and I, I did this uh, millipede, it was about this long. Um, all male shoes and, and the hat, um, and we actually had, we had a, we bought, I don't know how they do it, but we bought from mail order catalog this giant African millipede. It was like this long, you know, we got it shipped in from England, you know. <laughs> uh, and she was the house pet for a long time. She's, she's passed away now, but sadly. Um, so she was sort of the model. And then from that small model, uh, uh, these days, there are all different ways to do it, but you take computer scans and enlarge in foam up to a full-scale model. So uh, they route it with um, these big routing arms that gives you the basic shape, and uh, we cover that with plaster and then fine finish it, and that kind of, that, that's how you get from these small-scale models to the big-scale models. It almost always takes a lot of kind of visual tuning. Um, at that stage, at that jump up. Uh, this was the first proposal, photoshopped in from the small model. And these are the sections. Everything is cast in, it's a sand casting, everything's cast in sections and fits together like a puzzle. So you, it's, a, it's really a, uh, I've never made a sculpture this way before, you know. Um, these are legs and clay, and then we make plasters from them. 
And this is the work being finished in the foundry, the work that's outside. Um, and uh, that's Insun, the owner of the foundry, um, really a champion. Uh, I haven't told Patricia this, but uh, they were working till 4 a.m. the night before they picked it up at 9 a.m. <laughs> so the job was like, like this, you know. Um, I don't know, it's like the, the fish that grows to the size of the bowl it's given, you know, you, you just always end up uh, working to the deadline. Um, but she really did heroic work on it. So this is, you know, they would section it together and then they would crawl inside and weld each section and then add another section and weld it and add another section. So it, it was an, a big job. Yeah. And this is the raw bronze before patina um, and before the legs were all welded up. Um, and the patina is something that's sort of aging the bronze, it sort of kicks it in one direction, it's chemicals and heat and kind of pushes it off. I thought they did a really nice job. There we go. Those of you that weren't here during installation, um, I thought this was the best. God, isn't that amazing? When it went up there, I thought, oh, we should just stop the crane and leave it there, you know? Like, that would be it, you know? This would be the best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then down. And that's the little gal. And then there's the detail. So off the ground. I think that's it. That's, that's the day. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.